Interstellar travel is horrible. What with the cramped quarters of your spaceship and only a thin hull separating you from deathly cold and killer cosmic rays. Much safer to stay here on Earth with our gloriously habitable biosphere, protective magnetic field, and near endless energy from the sun. But what if we could have the best of all worlds? No pun intended. What if we could turn our entire solar system into a spaceship and drive the sun itself around the galaxy? Well, I don't know if we definitely can, but I don't know if we definitely can't. Moving the sun would be a prodigious technological feat, an act befitting a type 2 civilization on the Kardashev scale, the same technological realm as building a star-encompassing Dyson sphere. Although it'll be several centuries at least before we can reach that level, the actual physics of a stellar engine is easily explained in a short YouTube video in 2023, and that's what I'm going to do today. It's really just Newton's laws of motion. Newton's first law tells us that objects tend to coast at a constant speed unless acted on by an external force, say, the mutual gravity of the rest of the galaxy holding our sun in its orbit. But it's also possible for an object to change its speed through propulsion, ejecting a smaller part of itself at very high speed in the opposite direction to your desired direction of motion. Newton's second law says that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. If, say, a rocket blasts its propellant, the act of blasting pushes the rocket forward, and this is just conservation of momentum. A stellar engine follows the exact same principle, with the mild additional technical challenge of building a solar system scale structure to do the job. Although it sounds impossible to move something as massive as the sun, which weighs more than 300,000 Earths, we have a ready-made energy source to do so, the sun itself. It was Fritz Zwicky who first came up with a scheme to move the sun. Zwicky had a lot of wild ideas. He was the first to ponder the possibility of dark matter and predicted the existence of neutron stars and gravitational lensing long before they were discovered. In 1961, he proposed the first stellar engine. It was a giant particle accelerator in space that would shoot pellets at the sun at close to the speed of light. With enough kinetic energy, these would ignite fusion on impact and blast jets of matter off at high speed, pushing the sun. The sun's material would be its own propellant and energy source, although we need to come up with at least enough energy to power the particle accelerator. Now, Zwicky never did the math on how much fuel this would take and how fast the sun could go, and in his classic style, he never returned to the idea. But the proposal inspired humanity, or at least a few of us, to start thinking about how to move the sun. Although the next serious proposal was well over two decades later. In the late 80s, Soviet aerospace engineer Leonid Shkadov came up with a concept that doesn't require any external energy source nor even a propellant. The Shkadov thruster relies on the fact that light itself carries momentum. Each of those photons coming from the sun carries momentum away and so pushes the sun an infinitesimal amount in the opposite direction. The push is very tiny, and photons are emitted evenly in all directions, so the sun really stays put. But what if the sun could be coaxed into shining a little more in one direction? Shkedov's proposal was to build a giant parabolic mirror made out of a super thin foil the size of a planet's orbit. Photons hitting the mirror would be reflected back, transferring momentum to the mirror in the process. If placed just right, this outward radiation pressure would be perfectly countered by the inward pull of the sun's gravitational field, enabling the mirror to remain in a fixed position relative to the sun. The mirror is a solar sail in the truest sense, powered by sunlight and pulling the sun itself. There are two ways to think about how this works. One is that we consider the sun and the mirror as a single system which radiates light preferentially in one direction. Conservation of momentum then demands the system accelerate in the opposite direction. Another way to think about this is of the mirror as a giant gravitational tugboat. In this interpretation, the sun's radiation does indeed cause the mirror to accelerate in the opposite direction to the incoming photons, but the sail's own gravitational field tugs the sun slightly so that our star accelerates with the sail. Same effect, different interpretations. Positioning of the sail determines the direction of motion, which could in principle be in any direction, but you might want to be careful to keep the sail above or below the planetary orbits. 
Otherwise, you get roasted passing through the reflected beam or freeze passing through the shadow of the sail. But if you're a Kardashev 2 civilization, it's probably no big deal to manipulate the sail or the reflected beam to spare your planet. Besides being careful to not fry the Earth, we otherwise don't need to worry much about the planetary system. As long as the acceleration of our stellar engine isn't too high, the planets will just come along for the ride, held in place by the sun's gravitational field. And for any plausible stellar engine, that acceleration is going to be pretty small. For example, the acceleration produced by the Shkadov thruster will be less than a trillionth of the Earth's surface gravity acceleration. It's not so much of a solar jetpack to zoom around the galaxy, but rather a tool to tweak a star's existing galactic orbit. Over the course of an entire galactic orbit, this thruster could get a sun-like star a few tens of light years away from where you otherwise would have been under the influence of gravity alone. In the best case scenario, it would take a billion years to change the sun's orbital speed in the galaxy by 10%. But that could be enough to allow a long-lasting civilization to narrowly avoid a long-projected collision with, say, another star or a black hole. Or perhaps to pass alongside another star for easy migration, even maybe an entire planetary transfer as their home star starts to burn out. However, a Shkadov thruster is not quick enough to avoid imminent disaster. If we project that our system is going to wind up in the 100 light year kill zone of an impending supernova, we're going to need more hustle than the Shkadov thruster provides. Now, if you still have any doubt about the incredible value of YouTube science shows, it could be that one of them will save our species. The Kurzgesagt channel commissioned the next advance in stellar engine technology back in 2019, resulting in the Kaplan thruster a scheme which could potentially grant a thousand times the acceleration of the Shkadov thruster. This design starts with a Dyson sphere, or perhaps a Dyson swarm, which is basically many mirrors that either orbit the sun or float in place on its radiation. This structure reflects sunlight back to a specific point on the solar surface. This raises the temperature, increasing the flow of the solar wind emerging from that spot. This itself results in a very weak transfer of momentum, but now we add our thruster. One or more large, probably electromagnetic collection cones gather this ejected solar material and channel it into a fusion reactor where the helium is fused into carbon and oxygen. This produces an enormous amount of energy and that energy is used to eject the fusion products out the back as a propellant and also send a beam of hydrogen back into the sun. This is a variation of a sci-fi concept called the fusion candle, used to drive a gas giant around in space. It's also related to the Bassard ramjet, which collects interstellar matter and fuses it to propel a spacecraft, only here the sun is providing the matter and also becomes the spacecraft. In principle, you could imagine a huge number of these thrusters collecting the solar wind and using it to power the jets, all orbiting the sun and only firing once they're in position. An added advantage of this method is that it actually increases the lifespan of the star. Lower mass stars live longer than higher mass stars, and an advanced civilization might actually want to remove some of the mass of its home star in order to eke out a few more billion years. The process of doing this by reflecting energy back onto the stellar surface is called star lifting. Well, why not use the ejected mass to also drive your star around the galaxy? And with methods like this, it could one day be possible to radically change the sun's orbit, perhaps even reverse its galactic orbit to fly by and colonize many planetary systems, or even escape the Milky Way's gravitational field for a trip to Andromeda. By the way, there is an option if we aren't satisfied with merely changing the sun's orbit or wandering the local intergalactic neighborhood. If we were to use the Kaplan thruster or something like it to burn not just the helium but also the hydrogen, it's plausible to reach speeds up to 10% that of light. That would enable us to catch up to far more distant galaxies before they recede from our reach due to the expanding universe. On the other hand, burning the hydrogen instead of throwing it back into the sun would eventually drain our star of its mass until it faded into a dim brown dwarf star, basically a very, very fast-moving mega-Jupiter. To build a stellar engine of 
any sort, we're going to first need to master massive scale astro engineering. We're probably going to need to build self replicating mining and construction robots to disassemble entire planetary bodies to build these things. That's several centuries away at a minimum, probably more like thousands of years, if we get there at all. But that doesn't mean it's not worth thinking about this stuff now. For one thing, Understanding what's possible in the future might tell us how to detect other civilizations that have already reached these, frankly, ridiculous technological levels. Ever since Freeman Dyson first thought up his famous sphere, dozens of observational searches have been done. Sometimes they have looked for the excess infrared radiation that would leak out of the shell, and sometimes they look for weird flickering from orbiting panels obscuring the star from time to time. All have turned up empty. The same spirit, scientists have calculated how a star might dim if a shut-off thruster is rotated over it, perhaps as aliens look to change the direction of their star. Others have looked into the Gaia Space Telescope data for any inexplicably fast stars that might be zipping around the galaxy. Those searches have also come up empty, unsurprisingly. But that doesn't mean artificially accelerated stars don't exist just that they don't exist in sufficient numbers or with sufficiently high speeds or deviant orbits to be spotted. Yet. So, can stellar engines ever be built? We don't know. But the fact that this is even a maybe is pretty awesome. It's not something we should be spending a lot of effort on right now. We should probably focus more on the pressing matter of saving the planet. But here's another reason to save the Earth, so that in the far future we can pimp it and the rest of the solar system into the sweetest ride in the Milky Way, and then, from the comfort of home, explore the distant reaches of space-time. Before I go, I want to let you know that we're having a problem with the YouTube algorithm, triggered by our comment response live stream a few weeks ago. Our subsequent episodes haven't been reaching nearly as many members of the space-time community, and we need your help. The two best ways to help are one, click on the bell icon and select all notifications, not personal notifications. By doing this, you can make sure that you're always getting notified of every new episode of Space Time on your homepage. And two, join the early gang and watch the episode as soon as you can when you see it. Early viewership is one of the best ways to keep the algorithm happy, which helps spread the episode to the rest of the Space Time community. We love the community we've built and want to make sure that as many people as possible see each episode and can participate in all the right discussions in the comments section. Thank you for your continued support.